red gum. It's probably our best known eucalypt and it's deeply connected to our development, our culture and to our idea of an Australian landscape. But there's a lot that's still not known about the river red gums. Um, CSIRO scientist Matt Colloff has written a book about the red gums titled Flooded Forest and Desert Creek. Matt, welcome to the program. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Cameron. Thanks is, for having me. Is it fair to say that this is a book? This book is as much about our relationship with the, the landscape as it is a book about river red gums? Oh, yeah, very much so. Um, it, it's a story about the inland floodplains and, and rivers of, of Australia and the people for whom the river red gun is, and is ever present in that landscape mm. um, through drought and flood and bits in between. Is this unusual for a scientist like yourself to try to include the importance of the river red gum to people as well as a study of the tree itself? Um, a little bit. I'm, I'm an ecologist by, by training and I'm always amazed uh, by my ecological colleagues of, of how often people are absent from the landscapes that they describe and, and create narratives around. But uh, in, in the area of environmental history, there have been some superb um, historical accounts of um, Australian landscapes by people like Tom Griffiths and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's a little unusual for an ecologist to be putting um, the relationship between trees and people into a book, yeah. Mm. You compare the different relationships that people have uh, in central Australia versus the Murray-Darling Basin. How is the relationship different? Yeah, um, well, in the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, there have been <clears throat> um, substantial industries based on river egg gum, um, the timber industry, uh, and prior to that, um, uh, grazing within river egg gum forests. Whereas in central Australia, the trees are, are, are just form a, a narrow um, strip along uh, ephemeral creeks and rivers. And so they've never been present in... Um, a, 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 numbers that would have merited um, commercial timber production. So they're viewed differently because they're not being viewed as a resource. They're much more likely to be regarded as refugia for wildlife or uh, places for people to hang out and, um, and interact with nature. Um, and they have a spiritual component to them, a strong sense of, of what ties people to uh, to rivers uh, in that landscape. Mm -hmm. If we talk about the areas where the, the, re the red gums were seen as a resource, how valuable was mm. the industry or is the industry? Oh, look, it, uh, it, incredibly valuable. Between about 1865 and uh, around about 1890, um, the timber industry in Victoria, um, uh, the red gum industry basically, you know, provided um, uh, sleepers for railways, it pro provided construction materials for buildings prior to um, steel girders being developed. So the old technology was huge, great slabs of river red gum. And that built the wharfs and jetties and piers and all of that stuff. And many, many old Melbourne houses would be built on red gum stumps. And it was also used um, as paving material to pave streets as red gum blocks. So you, if you're in a city of Australia, good chance you're not too far from uh, <laughs> some timber from a river red gum being used in construction in some way. Well, cer way certainly Melbourne. Certainly mm. Melbourne, it was a big deal. And New South Wales had a substantial uh, red gum industry as well. Mm. well. What is it about the timber that made it so suitable? Well, it, it's um, it's <laughs> well because of where it lives, um, it's it's pretty it, you know it's got its feet in water a lot of the time, so it tends to be uh, fairly uh, resistant to, um, uh, to, to to decay, and it's um, it's quite resistant to uh, various uh, burrowing and and uh, um, timber destroying insects, um, and it was it was abundant and it was cheap. It was, you know, you could get in there and harvest in great slabs of stuff. You know, they, they, they cut down trees in the in the eighteen seventies like it was going out of fashion, and and they had to introduce licensing systems and con constraints on it. And it's quite interesting to see how 
different approaches to the management of timber resources in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, the contrast between Victoria and New South Wales, actually play out in the uh, structure and the appearance of the modern forest today on either side of the River Murray. You still see the consequences, do you? One hundred and yeah, you that do. is one hundred and twenty yeah. years yeah, old. Very, very much so. Yeah, what differences yeah, do you can. see? Well, in lots, lots of Victoria, in, in certainly in places like Barmer Forest and and um, uh, Kundruk, uh, uh, Gumbau Kundruk Perikuda, um, a lot of the trees were clear felled. Uh, the nearer the, to the river, the better, because they could be floated down to uh, timber mills. Uh, in places like Echuca or Barham. And um, so in the, on the Victorian side, there was a lot of clear felling. On the New South Wales side, they introduced a royalty system that actually protected quite substantial areas of timber and made it more expensive to, to harvest. And so the uh, what you tend to see on the New South Wales side is, is a lot more straight old trees. Um, on the Victorian side, nearly all those trees are gone. The only old trees are, are ones that were not of merchantable quality. And the forests feel different. They look different and they feel different. So Hard to put your finger on. Yeah, a lot of this is about feel, isn't it? You talked about mm, the spiritual mm. importance earlier. It's mm. a, an interesting place they hold in the Australian psyche and um, our, our sense of what an Australian landscape is. Yes. How quickly are they recovering now, the, the forests? Okay, well, when you say recovering, you mean from uh, the millennium drought or from the timber harvest? Oh, I was actually talking about <laughs> the, uh, the harvesting you were talking about okay. earlier. Okay, mm. all right. Well, they, the, most of the forests that we've got in the, in the Murray-Darling Basin that, that had been subject to timber harvesting are regrowth forests. Um, so there was uh, a fair bit of um, regeneration that occurred in the 1880s and a lot of those trees uh, 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 were then subsequently logged um, in the last couple of decades. Um, timber harvesting has it, it, it is, uh, um, reduced substantially since um, uh, a number of um, forests were put into national park status in New South Wales uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, look, red gum regrows like crazy. It really does. It's it's one of those um, trees that um, does incredibly well in terms of regeneration and uh, establishing new forest. You're hearing here from Matt Coloff, the author of Flooded Forest and Desert Creek. It's a book about the river red gum in Australia. Matt, uh, scientifically, how, how well is the river red gum understood? Well, um, there are lots of basic things that we don't know particularly in, in, in a great deal of detail. We, we, we know the, 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 the core elements of its life history and uh, uh, how it reproduces and when it reproduces, but we don't know things like, you know, how deep do its roots go or... Um, we don't even know how long they live. You know, an educated guess is about 500 years, but people have claimed, you know, up to a thousand years, although that, that's well outside the, uh, the, the, the range for, for, for many eucalypt species, so it's probably not as long as that. There are a whole number of different things that we don't know, and part of that is probably because they're such a common species in the landscape. They're so familiar. We're so, we're so used to them that um, uh, species like that tend not to get a huge amount of notice and study. It tends to be the rare and endangered and unusual and, and um, uh, uh, things that capture people's imagination and, 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 and get um, you know, people working on them and studying them and working out their life histories and so on. So, so red gums lagged a, lagged a little bit in that regard. Mm. Um, there's a lot to know about them still to be discovered. This is despite the fact that they, they feature, they always seem to feature in arguments about um, water policy and environmental debate. It's not just the areas of, um, uh, of forestry that you talked about earlier. So it seems incredible that we know so little about them. Well, we, that, that, that's right. We know, we, we've learned an awful lot in, in recent times about their water requirements and, and um, uh, uh, how often they need um, flood events uh, in order to survive and thrive and reproduce. Um, 
and they are part of that broader debate about how we get a balance between water for irrigation production and, and water for the environment. And many of the forests that exist now are multiple use forests. They're used for um, they have been used for timber production, some of them still are, but they're also places where people go for camping, fishing, boating, and that general recreation. They might go to walk their dogs. They're, they're important spiritual places for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. So they have this multiple use. They're refugia for biodiversity, they're important conservation areas, and often they're in parts of the landscape which, beyond that, river egg gum forest might be a semi-arid area or an arid area which doesn't have many trees in it so the importance of trees in that landscape signaling uh, where the river is um, signaling water and signaling life um, really plays into um, some some very fundamental elements that people relate to so matt given what what you said earlier that scientists tend to be attracted to the or the more exciting or rare species. Mm. Why on earth have you put so much time and energy into the boring old red gum? <laughs> well, the first time I went into a, a river red gum forest, I, I was just struck by a couple of things. First thing was that um, th there was just a single species of tree in this forest. It wasn't multiple species like you see in rainforest or or, or even in, in, you know, typical grassy box woodland that we see in the, the, um, uh, the, the, the western slopes of the Great Dividing Range. This was a single species of tree. And the second thing I noticed was how quiet and, and how, how the, the, the forest actually, uh, was, was invoking in me a kind of feeling of, of quiet introspection, uh, of observing what was going on. It was almost like a kind a hallowed place. It was quite, um, quite a calm and uh, place to be. Um, You're speaking more like uh, a writer or an artist <laughs> than a scientist here, man. Well, um, if we want to tell narratives as scientists, then we've we've got to actually start thinking of how you engage people in in that narrative. And and, mm. and there's a lot of science in this book. There's, a, there's as much ecology and as much uh, life history as as I can find. But but to reach people. Telling that story about the link between people and trees is very much a part of, of how you get them engaged and how you get them to see their landscapes in a slightly different way. Well, the book is Flooded Forest and Desert Creek. The author is CSIRO scientist Matt Koloff. Matt, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Cameron. You're listening to Bush Telegraph on RN.